we 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 know that Olga is approaching. She's in a taxi, uh, but very close to the school. And I was I was planning to introduce her as the first speaker uh, due to due to spe spe specialty of the day. But then she said, "Oh, you can easily invite Arnis to be the first speaker." So we will slightly slightly update our agenda. But uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to see you here today at Riga Business School. It's so great actually to see um, many familiar faces because uh, I was I was joking that uh, there might be some symbolic recognition uh, element given to those who attend uh, those uh, inspirational guest public lectures on a regular basis because I have noticed that we have few of you who are almost every time when we do something here for the for the broader audience you are here so it's a it's a great uh, recognition of, of what RBS is doing. Uh, I think that um, uh, the date in the calendar serves uh, very, very well to reflect on gender equality and leadership in general. Uh, today, this morning, there was a special event organized by, by students, by our uh, uh, male students for, for ladies. Uh, it's, it's so great uh, that we can move forward with another topic today uh, and uh, do you know that according to un uh, international women's day usually have a theme do you know what is the theme of this year long hair. <laughs> sorry long hair. long hair as a theme of, uh, um, uh, well, not exactly <laughs> yeah You are so inspirational because because the topic uh, itself is digital digital all very regular most probably you were more insp inspiring your, in your in your ideas so it's digi all uh, innovation and technology for gender equality so United Nations are addressing this uh, uh, digital literacy for both uh, uh, genders and and one might say that uh, hey Mount Everest and South Pole. Uh, w w in, in the day which is meant to be for digital topics, so why have you chosen to spend, uh, spend uh, the afternoon on exploring so soft topics? But uh, what I was thinking that actually time to time we need to get out of this digital environment actually and spend some time just with, with ourselves. And I think that uh, South Pole and, and also Mount Everest or any other uh, wonder of the nature is a fantastic uh, place where to where to get this uh, detox of uh, uh, digital topics so so we are a bit out of the scope from the united nations point of view but on the other hand uh, what surprised me and sanda sanda is the the organizing person of this event we were so surprised that whenever we invite you to learn like IT management, digital strategies. You know, we need to fight for your attention. But when we announced that we will have two fantastic speakers on so um, soft topic like being in a South Pole or being in, uh, on a mountain Everest, then the applications came in very, very quickly. So it was a good learning point for us that sometimes for business people, for, 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 for executives, it's so important also to to refresh the mind, to, to see the big picture from the mountain, uh, to walk, to challenge yourself a bit differently. So that's why we are here. We started actually with, with Arnis. Arnis was also Arnis. Is, Arne, you can come, come here. We started with Arnis, uh, knowing that he, he's recently back from uh, his, uh, he will tell himself uh, what, what it was and what it took from him, but from his challenging uh, uh, tour and Olga will join uh, in few minutes when the taxi arrives here. Uh, Olga will share her experience but I still felt that okay before we start as it's a day at least from the UN point of view meant for technologies let's try to to use chat GTP and uh, let's try to put one, uh, one statement uh, here uh, what to do on 8th of March. I was experimenting yesterday, so what it, what it, what it says. And then the, the uh, AI was th thinking a bit and then you get a very good answer, so you can see it. 
it reminds that it is, it is International Women's Day, which is good. Olga, welcome, welcome. We are still warming up, so you have some time to, to, to take a breath and be ready for the stage. But you will see I, what I like about chat GTP that as you as most probably you have tried it out, it gives a very structured answers. But why I felt that I need to share it on the screen because I like this first uh, uh, like first uh, suggestion, attend or organize an event. So it's somehow nicely, uh, nicely collided with, with what we are actually doing, that we are organizing events in order to recognize the gender equality and leadership. And now I'm almost like, it was like a scene. Uh, Olga, uh, welcome, uh, welcome uh, to Riga Sorry, Business School. On my own lecture. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it happens. So now I can, uh, Olga, is it still okay that Arnis speaks as the yeah, first yeah, one or I you want to? to hear. I don't know how this man has done what he has done. I'm, okay. like, I'm totally mm -hmm. amazed. So I really need to still listen. Because I remember when we had a common call, uh, Arnis was a real gentleman. He said, Olga, what you, I, I can't compare my experience, what you have done That's climbing why. the mountain. And then, and, then we, and then I said, okay, guys, we will sort it out in front of the audience uh, so you can prove point uh, uh, this fact. So um, Arnis was also, um, Arnis, uh, I will start Arnis with, with uh, with how I see you, Arnis is a regional director of HTT Pool uh, in Baltics, Nordics, and Poland. For those who maybe don't know HTT Pool, uh, HTT Pool is exclusively representing global uh, publishers such as Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Twitter. Uh, he's a passionate about basketball, currently a council member of Latvian Basketball Association. Uh, he's also advisory board member of Riga Business School and uh, yeah, entrepreneur and uh, in general, very active, uh, active person. So Arnis will be the first one to share his uh, unusual or maybe usual experience. And then I will introduce uh, Olga Kotova then afterwards. So Arnis, floor is yours. Thank you for the You can take the mid, yeah, it will not be, you will not hear the, the sound, it's oh, okay. just for the recording, but you can. Yeah. So yes, so the Happy International Women's Day, uh, Olga. Yes. <laughs> I thought I should have come with flowers as well, but then since I was late, then I did. Yeah, but it's okay. I brought flowers. So we we speak in English. Good. Uh, next slide. Yes, as um, Agnes introduced, uh, my name is Arnis. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, just uh, find me on a LinkedIn or scan this code. Um, yes, um, also going to have a little bit of interactivity in this presentation. So if you can uh, just, you know, remember this question. The question is, what is common uh, with the South Pole Expedition and EMBA uh, program at RBS? So just, you know, think about this through my presentation and Maybe some of you will get uh, get an answer. I don't have a price for it, but we can figure <laughs> it something out. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I mean, Agnes, uh, you did a splendid job. You covered everything. Um, yes, I'm uh, currently at HTT Pool. And this is my um, biggest, uh, most important journey so far at, uh, at the life uh, from the, um, let's say, um, em employment perspective. Uh, previously, I've been at uh, several other digital companies, um, several uh, entrepreneurial projects uh, was, was was involved, and uh, and yes, and very actively now um, discovering this, let's say, in a startup ecosystem and as an investor. So if you move on, uh, that's my professional life, uh, education, uh, guess what, uh, from RBS, and um, it's been um, it's been really. A nice experience and I think one of the biggest learnings uh, here was um, meeting meeting great people meeting great people at my EMBA uh, studies um, yeah so I like uh, basketball I was um, mm, professional basketball referee for almost uh, uh, 19 years almost 20 years and if it uh, means something for you then um, uh, I don't know if you take any sport, basketball, football, there is this crazy guy uh, running on the court and everybody constantly 
uh, screaming on this person and constantly are unsatisfied and unhappy about what the person is doing. So, I mean, I guess my normal status quo is to be comfortable in those very uncomfortable situations and to be fine when somebody is not satisfied with you, yes, <laughs> and just do what you need to do it, yes. Um, yeah, but I'm still, still, I quit that, but I'm still involved. I'm, uh, uh, as mentioned, the council member of Latvian Basketball Federation and also I'm doing some things for, for, for a FIBA. But yes, but, uh, but the basketball was a great journey in my life. I had my ambition to go to Olympic Games, which uh, actually never happened, but I still, I still um, climbed, climbed somewhere there, yes. So, but just understood maybe my capacity and, you know, level of the, where, where I can go. So, um, so yes, and uh, normally I'm like a normal, ordinary office uh, person. Uh, I like mushroom picking, <laughs> as like many Latvians do, uh, do some uh, bicycling. And I was uh, starting, uh, I was uh, doing this ice swimming even before when everybody started to post it on Instagram. So it's uh, basically, uh, I, I, tr I try to push my limits and try to kind of like you know, challenge myself. Um, yeah, so um, in the last year, I'll just uh, give a background story. I uh, did my first, um, and, and before that, I just had basketball, kids and, and work. And uh, last year, somehow I, I came to the conclusion that I need to, 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 to try something else in my life and uh, maybe go into some adventures. And my first adventure was climbing, uh, I would say, a real adventure was climbing Mount uh, Kasbegi, which is just uh, 5,000 meters high. And uh, for the perspective, Everest is almost 9,000 9, meters high. And I can tell you that uh, so far, that's been my the most difficult experience, really. Like the pressure on my body, the altitude, like everything. I think it was uh, the hardest uh, uh, challenge of, uh, of my life, what I did. And uh, most probably I will not do anything harder in the, in the future. Um, let's see. But so far, that's my kind of like, you know, conclusion. But um, that's also my motto of the life is that uh, one thing leads to another. Yes. So what means that um, also in the basketball game, I met one, one of my friends to whom I uh, told my mountain, mountaineering experience. And he said, yeah, but by the way, I'm uh, going for this um, adventure to the South Pole and, and that's, you know, like really like once in a lifetime experience. It's on my, always been on my bucket list and, and Arnis and I'm like super happy about, about that. And I said, good for you. And you know, I forgot about this. In a few weeks, I got the phone call and he's calling me and saying, Arnis, there is an opportunity of the lifetime. You need to join. I was like, what, where? And you have two days to decide. And there's, you know, those all great people going to be there and that's us two Latvians are going there. And I was like, consulted a little bit. And I think in, uh, in the same day, I told him, I will not tell it because you're recording this, but okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, let's switch to maybe to the next, uh, next slide. And, um, okay. So that's, uh, still the pictures from this, um, a crazy uh, mountaineering experience uh, that I had it climbing Kazbeki with my friends and really enjoyable and and of course you know the most enjoyable uh, moment was when I was down already there and and by the way there is big difference by reaching South Pole and climbing the, uh, the Everest the mountain yes uh, and the 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 difference is that when you climbing the mountain you still need to go back you need to go down, you need to descend. And uh, I mean, and that's not the pleasant uh, thing, yes? And uh, I believe Olga will tell about this. But once you reach the South Pole, that's it. You can celebrate, you can, you know, have this uh, moment of the celebration. So, so yes, so uh, let's, let's switch over. So yes, so then um, about this uh, South Pole experience, it was, um, I was a part of scientific research expedition and there were two groups participating and one group, and honestly, I cannot imagine that, just cannot understand. They skied uh, 1,100 kilometers, uh, literally from the shore of the 
continent to the South Pole, to the center. And um, us, with this bunch of guys, and I mean, those are really entrepreneurial guys, and uh, just to give um, the idea, so let's say one guy is the founder of uh, uh, TransferWise, and then there's some uh, tech company, uh, uh, company uh, people who, who had, you know, successful exits and now, you know, investing into the startup ecosystem and, and, um, and also, you know, some doctors. So it was pretty, pretty crazy and interesting, uh, interesting uh, people. And I must say that this was my, like, um, fast forward the uh, EMVA in just a week, you know, discussing with those guys and the way they think, the ideas and, and 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 everything so so yes and um, i have this quote here you know what uh, what says that what got us to antarctica got us to the south pole yes because i mean to get there to support the trip and etc it's been a lot of uh, grind yes i don't know if you understand it but it's like doing repetitively many things that you don't like and the whole journey in antarctica it was the same it was very uncomfortable conditions and very repetitive things every day, all day long, every day, all day long. And if you uh, switch over, then I have also some, some pictures. Um, yeah, so this is a picture of um, uh, my, my, my preparation. Be 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 before we went to Antarctica, we went to Iceland, to the glacier, to uh, experience uh, the environment where we will be at Antarctica and just to understand if we are fit enough to, to do the journey. And this guy uh, is uh, Louis Rudd, and he's been, um, uh, I mean, like crazy guy. He, one of the two only in the world who has crossed Antarctica from one uh, shore to another through the South Pole uh, in, a, in a solo. So basically alone with himself, carrying all the food and everything and, you know, living in the tent. So there's just two guys in the world and uh, there's a book about him and there's, um, uh, it's called actually Endurance, uh, the same as, uh, famous Shackleton book, if you Google Shackleton, then you will see it. It's like expedition that the guys did in 1914, um, unsuccessfully to the, to, the, uh, to the South Pole, but, but still it's, uh, uh, I, I mean, most probably in all EMBA programs, MBA programs, this is a good example of the leadership uh, they're referring, because uh, the guy didn't succeed to reach the South Pole, but he brought all his crew back uh, safely and everyone survived. So it's, uh, it's been like, have been um, uh, quite a journey. So yes, and, and he's working for that company, Shackleton, that organizes expeditions. So we went to Iceland, so what it is, Northern Lights, um, was the first time in my life and experienced the environment. Um, and, um, and yes, and so we arrived uh, at the South Pole. So normally trip for me was from Riga to Paris, from Paris to Santiago in Chile, uh, from Santiago to Punta Arenas, then from Punta Arenas, another four hour flight to uh, Antarctica, uh, landing on the, on the shore, somewhere near, near the shore of Antarctica, and then uh, another four hours with uh, such a plane to the last degree, so it to, means to the 98th of the degree, uh, we, 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 we landed in the snow and we started uh, our journey. So our journey was, was um, yes, uh, so our journey was looked like this. So basically us in the line uh, skiing for seven days. So I have really nice pictures. So uh, this is the first day of skiing. This is second day skiing. <laughs> this is uh, third day skiing. So it's it's a very very exciting exciting journey. If you can click, yes, good. Maybe video is not playing so well, but basically. Basically, you're skiing and you see white field <laughs> all day, <laughs> every day. And if you go at night outside, <laughs> you also see white, uh, white, uh, white fields. And uh, this is, um, how you call it, Arctic, Arctic day. So the sun is up constantly. It uh, goes the other way around. So, and you don't know when is the day, when is night. But you just you just walk. 
so yeah so good question uh, so um fun part it's it's at uh, 3000 meters height uh, i don't know why but also the density of the air is uh, is a bit uh, different there so it feels like 4000 and uh, so so we need to kind of like uh, acclimatize uh, so we arrived and on the first day we we took two legs we call it legs so you walk for 50 minutes ski for 50 minutes and then uh, you have a break 10 minutes so first day we took two second day we took five then the consecutive days it was eight and uh, then on the last day it was maybe 10 or 11 just to kind of get it <laughs> get it done and uh, on the break so basically you sit down on your uh, so you if you take maybe a couple of pictures back uh, so uh, yeah so it looks and actually uh, go ahead <laughs> so yes one more ahead so yes so it looks like this so you're carrying your pulka a uh, pulka i don't know why pulka because the brand is acapulka they call it pulka um so it's uh, your sleeping system bag and basically whatever is the stuff and uh, the water the the pee bottle um some some other stuff the food and you know carrying it's about maybe 25 30 kilos so it was not so heavy uh, but still uh my 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 leg not leg but back was uh, was hurting and, uh, and then yes when you have a break so you you sit down you open you take your stuff uh, tea you eat uh, kind of put some put some hot tea because everything is frozen and um, and then and then you start walking and the problem is is like normally you put your um, i don't know if you cannot see it well but you put uh, your hands in uh, like a big gloves which are attached to those po poles uh, when you know uh, skiing and then it's warm but uh, once you take off uh, for the food uh, you still have those uh, small gloves liners whatever it's called uh, and then it's really freezing and then you know first uh, first uh, 20 minutes it's really 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 cold it's like the, you can get the frostbite and yes and then at the uh, end uh, end of the day you arrive wherever and you put your tents up so you put the tents up and uh, that's uh, how you can like take take over night just show me how many minutes i have it because i, I can you know it's engaging but uh, it's uh, enjoying the concept all right all right yeah good so yeah so uh, we had uh, some guides who helped us uh, to so basically uh, the difference between this um, test uh, run in Iceland was that in Iceland we did everything in the tent so we were four of us in one tent uh, cooking and uh, and you know doing whatever uh, uh, but uh, here you know we were in the pairs in the tents and there was one uh, Kind of like a cooking tent which we put it like as a kitchen so everyone you know, like hanged out and uh, this the, had you know various discussions and so so and we, we try to change uh, the partner every night so we can you know have you know more communication and so so it was more fun it was more enjoyable because and during the day so um, normally we actually walked in pairs but you know everyone has a bit of different pace and and then you can choose what you want to do if you want to talk to the partner next to you or you don't if you don't then you are in your thoughts uh, or you know you're listening maybe audiobooks and audiobooks are tried uh, not for the first few days because to me uh, the altitude is like is a killing thing it's uh, um, i mean uh, I was like breathless already, you know, immediately, and I was like uh, really like I was sweating and everything was freezing, so it was a bit claustrophobic. But, but uh, I mean, nothing unbearable. Yes, it's just uh, maybe my equipment was not right or so. It's like one of my first experiences, such things. So, but, but yeah, and then you know you just walk and walk and walk, and so um, now it maybe doesn't seem so hard, but but I was like literally like counting like. How many minutes passed? Maybe 10. No, maybe it's already 30 minutes. Yes. And should I count now? Let's count it 1000. Let's count to, you know, like 200 and, you know, multiple times. So it's like, you know, you're always a bit, little, little bit getting crazy. You know, and, but yeah, but, um, but it's done. So, so, and as I said, uh, like really, literally, like the first 20 minutes, I was like, Arnis, what the hell you are doing here? You know, why, why? And then you have this. Okay, but you're not gonna be the only one to quit, yeah. So, so you just, you know, just get it through, yeah. 
uh, yeah, it's actually, you you sh shouldn't consider going back. So it's just, there's only one way <laughs> to go ahead. It's when you go on the mountain, then maybe you have a way back, but there's this, just go, go, go ahead. So yes, so, and then, um, so after seven days, actually at the sixth day, we saw something ahead of us, something like, you know, small tip of something. And it was like, oh, we are almost there, yes. So, and then it took another, you know, day, you know, to almost reach it. And when you thought that you are at the end, then, then uh, there was like, congratulations, you are almost at the South Pole. Because uh, there is a base, uh, which uh, I don't know what they do some crazy thing, like measuring some ice or something, but it's like one kilometer by one kilometer or 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, some kind of square, maybe one by one, I don't know. But, and, and you cannot go, uh, you cannot kind of like pass over there. So you need to go around because they're measuring something. So, so that's why they directly think all those explorers go extra mile, yeah? So, so, so yeah, and, uh, and, and we thought we are there, but we are not there. And uh, my friends, so this is, uh, this is this, uh, uh, this is Baltic crew, yeah? So this is uh, uh, Janis Berdigans, uh, James Berdigans from Printify. This is Tavet uh, Hindrikus from TransferWise. This uh, is me, but literally it can be anyone in the picture, yeah? <laughs> so, so, and you have full face mask and you just walk, so. So yeah, so maybe a couple more pictures and uh, I'm almost, uh, almost there. Um, it was typically like minus 30, uh, Four, for 35, mean minus 50, in minus 50. So, so yeah, so I, I, I mean, uh, the, I think I, I, I had some, you know, problems with my vision after, but uh, basically you can get this ice blindness, uh, snow blindness, and then uh, you get the frostbite and you saw, I don't know if you can see, but the mask is completely, you know, frozen. And, and then uh, we finally arrived at the South Poles. So, uh, poles because there are several of them there are uh, this is like a celebrational thing then this is geographical but then there are also like you can find the center of antarctica i mean and then there is magnetic one so there's at least you know four south poles so, so i can say I, i've been at the two so it's like geographical one so we folded out our latvian flag and and uh, we were there, so uh, happy, happy moments, um, happy moments. Uh, maybe one more slide, and and yes, and just to maybe to demonstrate uh, how it how it was. So when I was in the flight, uh, I was like, I was like you know naive and uh, a bit of uh, um, curious. So oh, it's going to be fun event, you know, with those guys and and. Uh, and then I said, as I said, then reality kicks in. And I think good that I didn't know that it's going to be so difficult because I'm not sure I would <laughs> got it through. I would actually sign it. Yeah. Uh, when, when it's done, I can, you know, make some jokes and laugh and so, but, but literally what you don't see is that it's actually frozen inside uh, like this as well. So, I mean, like I barely see something. Yeah? It's like, and on this last day, it was like very claustrophobic experience. But if you click, you can see that my face, I'm like opening up for you, just click. So, I mean, it was me before and there, okay. I mean, I look like I've been, you know, drinking uh, many days uh, or so. So it was really, really tough on my body and uh, the altitude and everything. And, but uh, to be fair, still, this is nothing to compare because I have another picture, which I will not show to you. Uh, after Kazbeki, the next day, I looked like a Shrek, literally, yes, because I somehow, I don't know, I swallowed uh, whatever it was, yes. So, so yeah, so, um, I don't know, anyone uh, ready to answer to, to this question? Once, once, you, once you are ready, please uh, uh, take I, us. I, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm the last with the question afterwards. Oh, or you wanted to have the answer no, immediately. No, no, no. no. So just, uh, but maybe someone is ready. Sorry. No, no, I, I, just, I, 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 I see some curious this. faces who would like to answer the question. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know. No, he said that he doesn't have it. Uh, okay. Uh, I propose that uh, we listen to the second speaker and then we move to the questions and answers because I have still this uh, 
uh, this question to Arnes, why? Uh, like, why? Because it was what? In a very detailed manner, but I think that we are every, every all of us are curious of this uh, uh, Simon uh, Seneca's question, why? But uh, you can sit and think on, on the answer if you still don't have it. Um, now, uh, just to have the equality, uh, Olga Kotova. I met Olga once when in my previous job uh, I was inviting. Uh, okay, let's let's start with the square one. Uh, uh, my task was to inspire the team. So I was searching of the person whom I would like to invite to to inspire others, and then I think that someone. Uh, suggested uh, and said uh, maybe you you can talk to Olga Kotova. Olga is aviation expert, uh, um, dreamer, entrepreneur, like everything uh, embedded in one person and I invited Olga. It was in, in uh, she, Olga was in, in a bank to, to visit uh, a broader team of mine and afterwards after that presentation, I, I said to myself, whenever I need someone who can inspire others, so that will be Olga. Uh, yeah, that will be Olga. Uh, and I think that uh, when I was running the uh, like digital TV program called uh, A Day After Leadership, uh, I invited Olga because she's really, really fantastic, inspirer, and sometimes, on, and sometimes on. I'm wondering how she manages that. Now, mother of twins, uh, and stepping into banking, like exploring banking after the aviation. So, Olga, floor is yours, and then we will continue with the Q and A session together with the, with Arnes. Cool, let's do that. You have set the expectations yes. so high that now I'm just wondering, like, how am I going to meet that expectation? But usually, when I agree to talk and to give a talk somewhere, I usually ask, like, why the hell? Like, why do you want me to speak? And uh, what do you want me to speak about? Because uh, the fact that I love mountains and I love aviation and I love sailing and I love my kids and I love whatever wine drinking means nothing to the broad public. And it can be extremely boring to listen to me like marveling about the mountains. So I ask, why the hell do you want me to speak? And Agnes was saying something like, yes, but we want to inspire people and want to say that it's extremely important to go out of your courage, uh, out of your comfort zone. And, and, and I was listening and listening. I think I don't buy that. Like I totally disagree. I think it is extremely unproductive to purposefully go out of your comfort zone. In fact, I think that too much, like too many of us are absolutely out of our comfort zones. And in fact, I think it will be way better for our psychological health, GDP of the country and whatnot, if we would please find the way into our comfort zone and kind of enjoying being in our comfort zone. Because what I think we do uh, mix, we mix the comfort zone and the routine, okay? Routine is not a good thing. This is, I totally agree. But the routine is really far from comfortable. Like a routine is like sucking the energy out of you. You wake it up on the Monday and you think not again. And, and then you kind of get yourself together, maybe somehow, and then off you go week after week after week. And that is not called comfort zone. That is called routine. And that is bad. But comfort is really good, but it's just very rare. Okay? It's always we're having something which is very far from comfortable. And uh, as additional hobby to whatever Agnes was saying, I also uh, am a coach. So I do meet uh, other fellow uh, business leaders and we talk about uh, about business development and a lot about personal development and a lot about uh, visions and inspiration and where to get that energy and so on. And basically we arrive usually to the conclusion that if you can allow yourself, like first of all, if you know where your comfort zone is and if you can afford the courage to have a journey towards your comfort zone. That's not gonna be easy, but that's gonna, gonna be very, very good for you. So I don't think we should talk about how to get out of the comfort zone. I think we should talk about how to get into the comfort zone. And sometimes the way into the comfort zone is not very comfortable. 
So sometimes the way into the, to this comfort zone is a lot of blood and sweat and tears. And I don't mean figuratively. I mean, very, very literally, like literal tears and literal blood and a lot of literal sweat and frost and whatnot uh, that comes together. Uh, but that is just that is just something that has to be done in order to find that comfort zone. And for me, the whole mountain story is uh, uh, it's less about uh, resilience and patience and pain and uh, prayers and a bit of more pain and all that. But it's more about what's at the end of it. And at the end of it is me getting a little bit better as a person with every mountain and me getting closer and closer and closer and, and for a longer time into this comfort in the comfort zone, like being in the comfort zone. It's almost like coming home. It's like you, when you are born, you don't know who you are and you kind of discover who you are as you go. And it's usually not a nice thing because you have a lot of mistakes and a lot of things happening, but you, you discover that. And when you are closer to, to understanding who you are, you feel way more comfortable with yourself and with your life. And that's what mountains are doing to me because otherwise I would not be doing it. Like, honestly, like why? So for me, that why is uh, in, in, the, in the result. For me, that why is actually, that is my journey in, into the comfort zone. And this is pretty much, I was very comfortable back then. I have, um, this is the top of Mont Blanc. Uh, for some time, uh, me and my husband had a, a tradition, and whatever we wanted to have like a romantic uh, getaway and we could afford a longer weekend, we would basically jet to uh, uh, Chamonix and go up Mont Blanc. And uh, uh, some time ago, you would uh, be able to do it with a tent. Now it is forbidden. It is a national park and you can also stay there in the lodge, which is totally different type of pleasure. But if you go there by yourself uh, with a tent, with your own pace, then basically that's what you get at top of Mont Blanc totally to yourself. And I think I was just sitting there and uh, drinking a uh, Coke and having no one around except my husband and thinking, life is bloody good, okay? Life was really, really, really good. And uh, uh, those uh, feelings, those moments, there's a something that you take with you and those are the moments of pleasure. And sometimes there is a moment of not that pleasure, not that pleasurable moments, but they kind of are making your life just way, way better. And I wanted today to tell you a little bit more about, uh, not about Mount Everest per se, because I've been speaking about it a lot and there's National Geographic about Mount Everest and there's a films about Man Mount Everest and it's like bloody boring Mount Everest. It's just a big brand name, but it's just basically another mountain. Uh, but uh, I was uh, uh, wanted to tell you a little bit more about the evolution because uh, big brands are something which are very easy to put on your like, you know, like to have a diploma about. <laughs> it's like I've climbed a big brand, but it, it's it's not the brand, it's the process. It's what behind it, it's the journey that uh, that matters the most, at least to me. And I thought I would be a little bit honest with you about, and I will tell you how it all started. So you don't, uh, we will not focus that much about the end. We will, uh, we'll focus more about how it all started. And it all started uh, here. Uh, this is uh, this is Iceland. Iceland is a fantastic place. Eventually, all the journeys are started in Iceland. And this is uh, Iceland. I happened to be there. It was not very planned. Mm, and uh, the hotel where I was uh, living uh, was, happened to have a renovation and the gym was closed. And I was staying there for two weeks and uh, uh, Reykjavik in uh, uh, February is not a very exciting place. There's like two streets like that and two streets like that and it's everything is absolutely closed. And uh, uh, so you, you really don't move. It's extremely, extremely boring. Uh, and uh, we decided with my friend that we will go for a hike. And we were not particular avid hikers before, like I was not hiking basically anywhere else. So it was just like a first uh, uh, hike. The very, very first hike was right in the center of Reykjavik. It was like a hill, which is about a kilometer high. I started to hike that hill uh, on a Saturday in uh, rubber boots, mind you. Uh, I hike hiked with the rubber boots approximately halfway, which took me, I don't know, like four hours. 
and uh, right about that two, ha two things happened first uh, the white out came it's like uh, the low cloud with a lot of snow and uh, those of you who ski who ski yeah it, it happens sometimes in the mountains you have this cloud you cannot see even your your uh, top of your fingers yeah uh, not you cannot ski the skiing pole for sure so that's what happened this cloud came uh, and immediately you totally lose track. You have no idea where is where is the road and where to go. And basically, the only thing you can do is just stay there and wait, because like you don't even see. Uh, is there's a lot of snow. You don't uh, cannot even follow your footsteps. And the second thing that happened is that I have heat inclination, which is basically like a little bit higher than this, <laughs> which is very difficult with rubber boots. Yeah, you have one step up and approximately three steps down. <laughs> and this is a not very productive way to move forward. So I think right about there, I waited when this white cloud uh, will go away. I froze uh, terribly and uh, uh, I came back to the hotel and uh, uh, warmed up in the evening in the shower. I actually f figured out that I'm singing, I'm super happy. And I thought like, this is really strange. Uh, because that was not an expedition success, you know, that was not an expedition success. But I was singing and I was so happy and I thought I should do it again. If I was, if I'm so happy, I should definitely do it again. So the next weekend uh, we decided with my friend that we will not go, go up the hill, we will go up uh, the highest uh, point in Iceland. Who told us that it's a good idea to, with zero experience to go to the highest point in Iceland? I don't know. Uh, and uh, we decided we will do some of the preparation. And uh, we thought we will apply a little bit of analytical thinking towards this. So we did the uh, uh, following thing. First, we googled on the YouTube uh, how to walk on the crevasse. So in YouTube, we figured out that you cannot walk on the crevasse if you don't have a rope system, because otherwise you fall in the crevasse, and that is a not a good idea if you would like to procreate. Then uh, we thought, OK, fine. So we Googled the uh, videos of how you tie the ropes. Uh, uh, then we thought we kind of understood it. And then we tried to find where we can we get the rope without buying a rope, because buying a rope in Iceland puts you another like 100 to 100 uh, euros uh, below basically the budget and what you do with this rope after. So we're trying to find the community of local people of where can we get the rope. We got the rope. Then we thought, OK, what else is important? Uh, then we decided the weather. Weather is probably important. Of course, we know that wind is blowing with the different speeds on different elevations. And we thought, okay, we check, we check for the weather. So we're checking for the weather to make sure that for the next couple of days when we will be climbing, there is a weather window. Uh, then there is no like nasty storms coming in or nothing like, of that sorts. And, and so we've checked the weather window. So now we have the rope and the weather window. Amazing. Then we found another friend who agreed to be a chauffeur because uh, this mountain is about like four hour drive from uh, from uh, Reykjavik and we needed to start going up at about six, seven o'clock in the morning and then we needed to somehow get back to Reykjavik. So we thought it's, it sounds like a little bit strange logistical challenge and in the summertime it's a lot of hotels and hostels and tents and everything around. It's like really, really popular mountain, popular hike, but apparently not in February. So in the internet, when we were preparing, we read, oh, then you will come by your car, you will see a big parking lot, and you will see like people there, and then you will basically see the chain of people going up. There is a very clear path. You just follow that path, and you will be up and down in no time. That was the plan, so the master plan. Another thing that we have prepared was we decided, okay, it's kind of, it's a volcano, right? Uh, how do we, how you draw a volcano? You draw up and then you draw like a crater and then you draw down. So I think, okay, crater, snow. Mm, so maybe it's a lot of snow in the crater. Maybe we need something like skis or something. So we decided to go for snowshoes. So how would we've, we've splurged? We have been uh, we've splurged on renting a snowshoes uh, in in Reykjavik, and now we are fully ready. We have a chauffeur, a rope, uh, YouTube videos, uh, and snowshoes, and we have read on multiple sites how to how to 
cl- how to hike basically it's not a climb really it's like how to hike uh, we had uh, we had also snow crampons we figure out we will need that and a little bit of some other stuff we basically had zero idea how to use all that it's like uh, based on based on youtube uh so we are arriving at six o'clock in the morning uh we're super sleepy uh, the sun is just getting kind of not even up because it's february uh and uh, we arrive to some place where should be a parking lot which is zero cars obviously like one meter of snow you can't really park there and they have no idea <laughs> where where the trail starts like there is no chain of people there is no clear path there is nothing but we had a plan b we took from a, another friend who's a local pilot, we took a, a very, very old GPS, which is the size of the watch approximately. And he said that he was climbing and he put a point there where, where the start of the journey and the end of the journey. But but uh, the screen is like really, it's, it's size of the watch and it's black and white. So it's like no color. So we're uh, searching for what is the starting point of of that uh, of that uh, trip but the moment when we were searching for that another car approached and we thought we are in a luck another car approached and there was a, f- a family of norwegian climbers uh the fa- father two sons and two friends and we asked them do you know where is the start of this uh, trip and they said yes we know very very well because it's a uh, uh, sixth time that we are uh, uh, hiking this uh, this hill this volcano. I said, oh, amazing how it is on the top. And they said, we don't know, we have never reached the top. And we said, that smells fishy. You know, what can go wrong? Uh, we said, you know what, we have no idea how to go there. So it, it, can we just follow you? They said, yes, fantastic. The more the merrier. So we will like, you will start and then probably we bypass you and you go somewhere there. So whatever, that's how we do. Um, and for the next, uh, few hours that's what we were doing uh we were bypassing them then stopping for i don't know a, a drink and then they've been bypassing us and then they've been stopping and that's how we were progressing and uh, uh mind you when we were preparing that and when we read that it is 14 kilometers and two kilometer elevation up said nothing to us it's like 14 kilometers doesn't sound that bad like two kilometers up doesn't sound that bad either. Now I know that never, just without any particular preparation before and without light, don't go because you will not be up and down in less than 10 hours and then winter is going to be dark. But I know it's now, I didn't know it before. So then at some point of time we have reached the the glacier and uh, Norwegians have reached the glacier and uh, we are finding our rope and they are looking at our rope and they said that's not a proper rope. Like you, you won't be able really to secure a person, a heavy person with that rope. Luckily I've not been considering myself a heavy person so I thought with the help of a proper rope and my guardian angel and uh, and basically being very very careful we can probably we can probably do and i've been super lucky i have a really good guardian angel this is a really workaholic guy or girl never put me down never put me down so slowly but surely we climbed that uh, that uh, hill we reached the crater we got out of our snowshoes and we snowed through the crater and approximately like at five o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon we've been on top of this first hill and we've been pretty tired but super happy we also had zero food with us for the day we kind of didn't occur to us that food is important we had half a liter of water for two people very clever so then we were going down i think we went down and have been in the car at about uh, eight o'clock in the evening when total pitch dark we had no basically idea how we reached the proper car uh, met our uh, our friend who had water and the sandwiches his best friend up to today we still remember that and uh, funny enough Norwegians have not reached the top because they had no snowshoes so by the moment when they have re- reached up to the crater, they have figured out it's about a meter of snow where with every step you go down to a meter of snow and it's just not feasible to cover four kilometers of the crater with the snow like that. 
And then uh, uh, next uh, day, we decided to speak about it, like during the breakfast, like what have just happened and uh, what are we going to do with this experience? And uh, there have been a lot of lessons learned. Uh, part of that was equipment is important. Planning is important. You can learn a lot on YouTube, but you should not be relying on YouTube for the sake of your life. And uh, that all in all, although technically it has been a disaster, like we shouldn't be doing a lot of things that we have done, but somehow we kind of, both of us, we really, really like the process in spite of the fact that there was no water or no food, or in spite of the fact that we've been very tired, in spite of the fact that we had not proper equipment, like I was looking like this, it's a cool mountaineering hat, yeah? <laughs> uh, but uh, we, 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 we liked the, the process that we said, let's see, let's see what else uh, we can do, let's see how it works for us as a couple, uh, let's see how we can stretch it because life is so, so short that you find something that you really like. There is really no reason of not doing it. And we said, let's learn all the mistakes that we have made and say thank you to the garden angel and try not to make those stupid mistakes. And basically, let's see how we can stretch it. And uh, a few years down the road, I was not looking like this. I was looking like that. And that is uh, uh, 37 kilograms to be exact on my shoulders and uh, 25, 27 on uh, uh, the back. And uh, we are going uh, uh, up the mountain. It's basically not this nice, nice picture, same, same pictures as before that you have seen people are going across the plain, same, same thing, just vertical. Yeah, and basically uh, what you have, you have uh, a rope in front of you, uh, you are tied because to another person because there are, uh, there are real serious crevasses, you cannot fall there, it's, it's, it's little, and uh, what you do is you walk for one hour straight, everyone knows it, so you can monitor the progress, you can walk for one hour straight, then you have between three and six minutes break, three minutes is a short break and six minutes is a long break. And during that break you can, you have to focus before what you want to do during this break because the options are you can either drink or eat or pee. You can't drink, pee and eat in the same three minutes, you know, impossible. Yeah. So you really need to focus that if uh, during this break I will drink, then during the next break in another hour I will eat, and then during the next break I would pee, or I reverse the priority depending what I will feel like. But you really have to, to focus. And if you want something to do with your equipment or something else, then you skip the drink or the eat, or you don't skip the other one. And, and then you kind of uh, re reconsider your, uh, your priorities. And during these three minutes, what you do, there is, there is a bit of like a trail uh, here. Here it's not that important, but in some areas this is kind of important. It's a short, uh, it's, it's a narrow trail. So you do one step here. So if anyone wants to pass, like your other team can pass. We had a team of four people in like one, one rope is four people, another rope is four people. Uh, you uh, take down your uh, 37 kilograms uh, from your back. You get a down jacket from the top because you need to cover yourself because otherwise you freeze immediately and you cannot, avoid, uh, you cannot afford to lose energy and lose heat. So you need to put a lot of down on you then you either drink or, or eat or whatever you need to do. And then in uh, like two and a half minutes, if it's a short break, you pack your down jackets and you step back and approximately in the same kind of 10 seconds, everyone should be ready because you cannot just stay there without down protection and not move because you freeze. And, and then you need to start to move with the same pace because then you need, you'll get warm again and the pace is the same, and then you do like that for about eight times per day, and sometimes 12 times per day, and uh, then you have arrived to the uh, camp, and then uh, it is a hallelujah, you can dig the tent. So basically what you do, you take your shovel, and you go digging, and you sometimes dig a little, and sometimes you dig a little bit more. 
So you dig and dig and dig and then you build a tent and then you dig some more and then you build a kitchen tent and then after you build a kitchen tent then you dig a little bit more because you're going to dig a toilet. And then you cook and then you sleep and then next morning you do all the same uh, one more time. I think after that expedition that is Denali in Antarctic in, in our, uh, Alaska. Uh, after that expedition for some time everything that I've seen during my sleep was the orange rope. This orange rope that is kind of in in front of you, that orange rope. You just see the white uh, something and the orange rope. That's basically what you see in your, in your sleep for, for a long, long time. So that was one very, very beautiful expedition. It's probably the most beautiful ex uh, expedition up to date. It's, it's a polar day. It's amazing. You see it's beyond words. It's beyond words. everything else. All, everything that I was talking to you, like all this uh, military regime and going up, and there's 40 kilograms on your back, and uh, uh, the going down. I will not even go into details. It was a bloody disaster. But all that was worth it because you are coming down a totally different person than you're going up, and and you're kind of flying home a totally different person than you flew flew out. And uh, if there is a fast forward miraculous way how to have how to become a better person then it's probably that's the, the best investment for me and uh, yeah so there have been many 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 expeditions and many mountains and a good experience and a bad experience and uh, a lot of crazy mistakes and, uh, uh, and then one day I found myself on top of Mount Everest yeah, and the rest uh, and the rest is history. And actually, standing on top of Mount Everest, you literally see the curvature of the Earth. So you 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 basically standing approximately at the same altitude as the airplane you're flying. The airplane you're flying about ten kilometers high. You're standing about nine kilometers high. Uh, so you see the curvature of the Earth, and you can actually see that the Earth is round. Uh, yeah, they have been the teachers at school. They actually tell you the truth. Okay, I've checked. <laughs> I've checked. <laughs> yeah, but again, uh, I think the most important is not um, climbing mountains or or going to South Pole or not going to South Pole and not climbing mountains. I think the most important is to find in 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 life uh, something that makes it's like something that works for you, something that breaks that routine and gets you out of the shell and gets you out of the uh, of the routine and gets you on the track of of dreaming on the track to the comfort zone and actually on the track to you and if you can do that and you can base your decisions based on that that i think is the biggest privilege and the biggest luck and uh, the best uh, outcome so uh yeah that's approximately where I can end <laughs> for, for now. And if you have any questions about uh, mountains or non-mountains and other stuff, I would be happy to take it as well as uh, my fellow colleague. Uh, Olga, thank you very much. I think that uh, I would like to have you here in front of the audience. Uh, I, I, I am, I'm sure that you have questions already because I have many of them. Uh, I would love to give a floor to you. Uh, Olga, if you don't mind, so that I'm not hurting anyone with throwing, uh, I will do, do like that. Do you want me to I, throw? I, no, no. Uh, I will just do like that, that you have that mic and uh, if okay. you have any questions so that as it's recorded so that people hear the question. Eva. Eva is one of those persons who deserve a special uh, recognition sign because of attending almost all the events so that I know the name. <laughs> Eva, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Olga, for your inspirational speech. I heard you before and I hear you again and it's again very, very nice <laughs> to hear you. Thank you. And um, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, in these mountains, you must have uh, these breaking points, not even once. So what do you do in these crazy moments, crazy dark moments? What is your uh, secret sauce, maybe? You know, uh, that will that will sound, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe unbelievable, the big like huge breaking point i think i remember only two one was on everest and another was in denali and uh, on everest it was like this like the whole expedition is two months 
so so you basically you're in the mountains for two months and uh, uh, approximately 10 days you're getting from the nearest airport uh, to the base camp uh, the base camp is approximately the elevation of Kazbegi, so it's 5,300 meters. And it is true, uh, you're all swollen, you're, like, uh, you're, you're not in the best shape, but you acclimatize. And then for approximately uh, a month, you are preparing. You're basically going uh, up and down, up and down, up and down the mountain. Every time you're going a little bit higher, and then you return a little bit higher. And then uh, you uh, go up and down, up and down, then you go back to this kind of base camp, because after some time, your body thinks that, that 5,000 meters, 5,300, I think, to be exact, is a nice altitude compared to everything which is up uh, there. How, uh, and then uh, uh, after, after you have prepared, you're looking for the weather window for the summit. And sometimes the weather window is tomorrow, but sometimes the weather window is like after one week. And then for your body, uh, it doesn't really make sense to stay at, in five and a half kilometers because you're at, at this altitude, you almost don't heal. So you basically observe yourself dying. That's really fun. Like you, you, it's really, really fun to think. Uh, you, don't, you don't get this experience here because here in the evening, if you cut your finger, you wake up in the morning. Okay, if you don't cut it to, your, to the bone, but basically in the morning, you don't really remember that you have cut your finger, right? And also if you have a little bit of sore throat, you go sleep, you have a tea, you wake up in the morning like you're fine. And uh, uh, on altitude above 6,000, you don't heal. You cut your finger, you wake up in the morning, you have a cut finger. You wake up next morning, you have a cut finger. Two weeks down the road, you have a cut finger and it hurts. And it, and it hurts way more than on the first day. <laughs> so you almost don't heal, but you heal a little bit. Uh, at about the base camp, which is like 5,300. So you, you heal there a little bit. And uh, so you, for your body, it makes sense to uh, go down uh, to like four kilometers approximately to the point where you have some greens, like not, not trees maybe, but some shrubs. Because if there is a greenery around, there's an oxygen. And basically what your body needs, your body needs some oxygen. So you're going down and spend there for about like three, four, five, six days uh, to heal, uh, to get this oxygen, and then you go up uh, for the summit push. And apparently at this point, you should be the strongest. You should feel yourself like on top of the, of the world. So we're going down and uh, I had some bad, bad inflammation and I think I had some... Uh, sinusitis when you hear uh, when this inflammation and you cannot breathe and I think have some some tonsillitis. So basically, basically I had all whatever whatever possible to have and then I would say I decided to drink a course of antibiotics so I go down to this four kilometers and I spend there for five days and I drink a course of antibiotics and then I will get better and my inflammation will go away and uh, that's a, uh, and I will eat because you have no appetite when there is no ex no oxygen uh, and all will be good. So I go in down, I spend in there five days, I'm having my course of antibiotics, my inflammation is gone, I breathe normally, like my throat is normal color again and I have a lot of appetite. I eat like uh, three men, so I eat basically five lunches during the day. Uh, I gain a little bit of weight even, so it's all amazing. And I think now I'm on top of the world, like I've never been in better shape. Um, the weather windows looks extremely well, so I'm just going back uh, to, uh, to the base camp and off we go. And I start going to the base camp and I understand that my, my, I just cannot move. Like I know the pace, how I should be going, and I know what is acceptable. And I'm like two to three times slower than acceptable. Basically, if I continue to go with the same pace, I have to sleep under the shrub because I will not be able to make it to the nearest village where I can, I can sleep. And I thought to make it in one day to the base camp rather than in two days, which is a normal like pace. And I cannot even make it in like half, half uh, distance. And that was my very big breaking point because I was like, what the hell? Like, what else can I do? Like there is no, there is nothing I can do better. I have eaten, I have rested, I have got medications. There is nothing I can do better. I probably just have to pack and go home. Uh, and I think I wasn't particularly doing anything about it. There was no, no choice. I was basically, I think I was crying in the snow and going up. That was my, <laughs> that was my uh, tool. <laughs> and then I arrived uh, late, late at night uh, at this sleeping uh, place. 
uh, and luckily they had place for me to sleep and uh, I was uh, uh, reading the Tibetan book of the dead <laughs> drinking tea and contemplating about basically the purpose of life uh, uh, yeah so <laughs> there was not a particular recipe how I can say do this and you're going to be fine no no and uh, uh, Luckily, when I arrived at the uh, um, base camp, I thought I need to talk to somebody about it. And I went to the local base camp doctor, who's usually not talking to kind of a nervous woman uh, about their problems with antibiotics. He's talking about like uh, evacuations, inflammation, death and all that. And I said, oh, please talk to me. <laughs> And he said, uh, have you been taking uh, antibiotics? And I said, yes, I did. And he said, yeah, but then you have to expect for the next three to four days, your body will not be functioning. That is exactly the normal way how the body does. You have the same uh, uh, effect here. It's just plenty of oxygen and you don't have that amount of effort. So you don't notice. You can get into the car, you can go to the office, you can uh, make some decision making. Uh, you don't notice that your body is that much deteriorated, but here you just notice. Mm -hmm. So you will be fine, just wait a couple of days. And luckily the weather, the weather window moved, so it's going to be lo was longer, because if it would, wouldn't be moving it, then I wouldn't probably be able to climb it. Uh, yeah, but he said it basically just... This is the normal reaction. So one one uh, thing that I have discovered when we take antibiotics, we have to be really uh, uh, taking care of ourselves more than than we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Feel free to raise your hand so that I can pass the microphone. Something. Meanwhile, ah, meanwhile, I will be throwing while, it. <laughs> while, da while Davis is preparing. Uh, 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 Arnis mentioned that uh, Arne, you, you were you were counting from one to thousand. You were doing different exercises. Uh, can you share uh, Olga as well and, and Arne maybe uh, some some other tips and tricks how to you know to, how to maintain you during this uh, one day repetitive uh, actions? So any any other interesting elements how to keep yourself? I actually wanted to answer to your question why. Oh, first. you want to start with that? Please do. Yes. Oh, please, please, please. <laughs> because Olga sh shared her why. Um, I didn't do it to inspire you. Um, <laughs> yes, so it's, it's a truth. <laughs> and um, I did it to stretch my uh, uh, this zone of being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because to reach, to become comfortable, I still need to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, you can ask the same question, why uh, did you enroll uh, in EMBA program or MBA program? Yes, obviously, because you wanted to become better, more successful in your life. And, uh, and I think these things what I did, it's not to become incrementally better, but actually exponentially to change, to change mm -hmm. uh, significantly, to meet um, people that can help you to grow exponentially. And I think, uh, I mean, also at the MBA, MBA, I think it was one of the greatest programs I had when uh, uh, I think we were one of the pilot groups to experience this uh, leadership uh, practicum that uh, that was introduced, this LDP, whatever it was called, yes. And and this is a life learn journey, which also helps you to understand that at certain time in your life, you are at a certain uh, stage and and you and you delivering specific things so i think my inspirational time will come still now i'm in a, a extreme delivery time yes and if you look at that um i uh, i mean maybe this concept which i will share with you is not uh, popular and uh, maybe it's controversial and against all the life of i mean work life balance and and uh, i'm sorry but i'm joking that uh, there is a generation now uh, that are very sensitive to many things, yes, and and um, and I, I just want to say that I think uh, what I'm now doing is similar to what uh, sportsmen are doing, uh, professional athletes. So if you look at uh, Christoph Porzingis, then uh, you know that he plays in completely different level, and I mean uh, there are many different things that he, he does and has done and one of that is genetics obviously yes because he's two meters 20 and you cannot just you know compete and then uh, if you know if you as an amateur go and play against him you have no chance yes 
obviously. I mean, I know that I'm already going too far with my concept, but my concept is the same as, uh, as uh, for the managers. I'm Honestly, I'm not the manager. I'm not the best manager in the world. I mean, I'm very uh, unpolitical. I'm, you know, I, I have many aspects that I need to, to, to learn. Uh, Arthur's, by the way, been working with us uh, m many years and he's now, uh, he's now, uh, he was uh, hired by TikTok and was representing TikTok in this region. So, but, uh, but yes, but, um, uh, but, but what I want to say it, um, what I'm doing, I, I want to become the best at what I'm doing. And I'm stretching my limits because to me, work is a pleasure. I'll enjoy it. I know that I have short time to bring the, uh, the value. And once I'm done, then I will be enjoying the comfort zone and everything and, and traveling more to the nicer, more warmer places. Yes, and, uh, and, 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 and so, but, but now I'm in a delivery mood and it's the same as for the sportsmen. They have very short career. And, and, and the problem with, let's say, Latin professional athletes is that they get uh, derailed, you know, it's like some girlfriends and, you know, parties and, you know, who knows. But, you know, I'm, I'm, you, know you need to focus. You have such a short time, 20 years maximum. You need to focus, deliver, and then you can enjoy it. So I'm stretching my limits, uh, definitely. Uh, I also had my, uh, let's say, midlife crisis. So, I mean, all the combination and that's... Uh, and that's why. That's why. Thank you for your very honest answer. Uh, before Davis uh, uh, asking his question, so uh, you counted till thousand uh, Olga. So what what do you do when you walk? Gosh, uh, you suffer for the first ten to fifteen minutes. So the first ten to fifteen minutes, when you're going up uh, the mountain, you think first the first break will never come. The first break, which is like after one hour of walking. It will never come and I will not survive. Then you think, how the hell good am I if I'm suffering after seven minutes, okay, eight minutes, <laughs> and I cannot uh, move and I cannot do any, like how am I gonna do that for the next 14 hours? Like how exactly? And tomorrow is gonna be way more difficult than today. So you, you, you dive into this uh, uh, suffering and self-doubt. And then uh, comes experience, and then experience uh, surfaces and it goes like, eh, you've had those ideas before, right? It is not the first hour you had those ideas before, it was the same yesterday. And then you kind of understand that it's a triumph of optimism, of optimism and experience, and they said, like, yeah, you're gonna manage. So uh, approximately in, in 10 to 15 minutes, your body warms up and all the muscles will work, warms up. And then you get into this normal repetitive movement, even if it's very hard, and then your brain goes into the zone. And then I prefer that my brain goes into the zone and stays into the zone, and then I, I don't count, I don't listen to the music, uh, I, I just, I just mm -hmm. go to the universe. Because if I, if I do, uh, if I don't let my brain to go into the zone, it's gonna be way more difficult for me. Mm -hmm. If I focus on the uh, objective, like if I focus, I have to go to that uh, stone, or if I have to go to that summit, it's it's for me it's way more physically difficult so i just have to go, have to send my brain to the zone mm -hmm. and then the next hour it starts all over again mm -hmm. it's like you're you're exactly the same place like it's been four minutes i'm suffering already it's not gonna happen and uh, yeah <laughs> my friend uh, when we were climbing this cat baggy he said arnis just get uh, to the state that you understand that the suffering will never end mm -hmm. that's it Mm -hmm. You know, that suffering will never end. And you just, you know, you just mm -hmm. continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a normal status quo. Mm -hmm. It's going to mm -hmm. suffer. It's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Actually, it helped me. Yeah. I have a question something similar to what you're talking about, delivery phase. And I'm going to try to make this personal. So the answer is not just it depends, right? So talking about the delivery phase. So let's say you're in a career or just starting a company when you're you have to deliver or just maybe in starting a family, like, I guess it kind of can be related that you have to, you have obligations. For example, you have a startup, you have a funding round that just started and you have to work like 12, 13 hours a day. And talking about that routine, should one even like consider breaking out that routine? Is it like useful during that delivery phase to break out at all? And uh, 
to make it personal, I know that both of you as entrepreneurs had that phase as well. And looking back at it, like, do you think it's it's important, productive to do that? And if yes, how much is okay? No, of course, uh, the first thing I want to say, it depends. Uh, yes. Um, Arne, you should use the microphone. Yes, thank you. So, um, I mean, um, uh, I, I, I said that in my uh, kind of presentation that what you got you there, uh, got you to the top, to the Everest and etc. So this is, you know, doing routinely, uh, consistently many of those things. And, um, um, okay, it's very philosophical, but we people tend to think incrementally, yes, that, uh, that uh, let's say now I'm at my uh, uh, specific uh, phase, um, a specific, I don't know, phase of the work, and, and now I will go to my boss and ask increase of the salary for 10%, as an example, because if you ask 50%, they will say, you know, you're, you're crazy, you know, it, it is like this. So, yes, so this is why you are turning uh, to become as an entrepreneur because you want to earn exponentially more yes than let's say uh, your current uh, comfort zone is, uh, is is bringing to you yes so but but i just think that um still you have to go through this phase in your life where, because uh, again i'm jumping from topic to topic but but i don't believe uh, to the books uh, you know that uh, startups are writing about let's say steve jobs or or um, uh, bill gates when the guys just finished the school and immediately became successful entrepreneurs, because this is too romantized. Yes, it is not happening now. So I believe more into the uh, to the uh, concept that you need to build up your skills as a specialist, which means you're going through this, uh, uh, let's say, routinous uh, uh, steps and stages, and you're doing this green and repetitive things along with you know I don't know building your family and so. Uh, and but in the same time you're preparing the grounds for something for the jump yes so it's it's the same as with Everest you don't climb the Everest in the first day you are preparing for it's a two months uh, journey yes so the same is uh, is is, uh, is 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 in your life so I think uh, you need to do a lot of that you know grinding thing uh, routine thing and so but then you need to prepare yourself for the next jump in my case my next jump in the journey of entrepreneur was at uh, approximately 40 uh, years of age when uh, I mean I was in a comfort I had stable job I have family I have my uh, you know credit whatever you know this what I need to pay and uh, I need to take a step jumping out of that uh, you know that, that thing so so and uh, the, the question is what's going to give you the impulse of doing this what will help you uh, to give this um, uh, next next jump if it's Everest, if it's uh, Kazbeki, if it's uh, South Pole or what, uh, Mont Blanc, I mean, I mean, yes. So, uh, I mean, uh, you need to get the time for yourself to get out of the routine, to get the energy and the, let's say, conviction of yourself, the self-confidence that you're ready for the next jump. Sorry. I will take over. I, I, um, I try to be as honest as possible from my perspective. Uh, because I don't think universal universal recipe exists. So first thing, according to me, doing 12 hours or 14 hours or 16 hours or what you really love is not a routine. Uh, I think that if you are in the phase when you don't want to go to sleep uh, and you want to wake up because you're just really, really interested in what you're doing and it just requires a lot of time and a lot of hours, just bloody enjoy. Okay, it's not going to be forever. It's going to be end. Like, I, I guarantee you it's going to end. And uh, uh, if you consciously know that you are in the place where you want to be and you do something you want to do and in order to achieve the results you want to achieve, it costs you 16 hours per day, you'll be my guest. Yeah, it's not a routine, there is nothing to break. Uh, enjoy and take care of your health if you are in a good shape. And basically, I don't know, eat, drink, sleep occasionally. You're young, you can do it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so I don't think it's a question of routine. If it is routine, if you're doing something that you hate, if you're doing something for the sake of doing it, if you're doing something because the obstacles are so, and you don't see the big objective at the end, Okay, then run away. 
you, you will figure out the alternative pace, uh, the alternative way. But then don't do anything for the sake of doing, not 12 hours per day, not two hours per day. Uh, so I think, uh, first of all, it depends on what it is for you. Uh, second, I think it depends on what you're trying to optimize. What, what, where are you going? Uh, and uh, it's privileged to know where, to, where to you're going. It's privileged to understand where, where you're going. Uh, it, it just, I've been super lucky that I understood how I function quite early on. And I understood that I, in order to be happy, I need to optimize uh, freedom and interest. So I need to have a very interesting life and I need to have enough freedom to, to make an interesting life for me. And those are my two starting points. And, and money, titles and everything else, they're going way after. Like I, so I optimize these two. But it, it, again, it have been, I just been, been lucky so I was able to discover it kind of early on. If you can discover what you want to optimize in order to feel happy, optimize that. 12 hours, 16 hours per day, doesn't matter. And the number three, and the last one, is everything has a cost. Everything has a cost, everything has a price, every dream has a price, and then the flip side. The moment when you go up Mount Everest, you're probably missing on a birthday of your friend. If it's just a birthday, there's probably something you can miss. If it is your friend's last birthday that you didn't know, that will be the cost that will be with you forever. Would you? Would you do different? Have you known it's all kind of in, in, invalid? Uh, what if it's all not valid? You know, you cannot base, base your judgment on what if. But everything has a price. Uh, 12, uh, 14 and 16 hour days, even if you do what you love, has a price. It has a price of your body. It has a price in your relationships. It, it, had, it, it, has, it, it costs you something. Like fulfilling every dream going to cost you something else. And I think it is important to be honest with yourself. What is the potential price of what are you ready to pay for this? And if you're ready to pay for it, to pay it, go on. And if you're not, that's probably the, the time to reconsider. Mm -hmm. uh, Olga, thank you for your answer. Uh, do you have anything to add or we can move on? Any other questions? Uh, I, I uh, based on today's topic, uh, like gender equality, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes wondering uh, I'm sometimes, sometimes wondering, uh, apart from Olga, your experience when you were with a husband, so it was uh, equality perfect. Uh, Arne, uh, can you share how it looks uh, on, on, on a South Pole in your uh, expedition? Is it guys or ladies uh, as well? It was two groups. Um, Sorry. In the first group, uh, it was supposed to be... How this everything started? It actually started by comparing uh, men with women on the endurance uh, on endurance uh, from the endurance perspective, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the the idea was that there were some let's say military British and military guys who did the expedition to the South Pole and they lost uh, they lost a lot of uh, muscle mass and I think they cancelled actually that uh, that trip because they couldn't just mm -hmm. just to, to, to sustain it and then a couple of years after it was some uh, beat, uh, some ex sport biathlon uh, ladies that were doing the same journey and they actually arrived at the South Pole so they uh, kind of like beat the expectations of of mm -hmm. uh, what everyone had yes so it's a uh, very inspiring, yes. But uh, then, you know, some uh, scientists decided that no, now we need to kind of like uh, figure it out why it, why it worked like this. So, so then they introduced this um, uh, research project, mm -hmm. and they were supposed to compare five uh, women versus five uh, five men. Eventually, it was six men versus four women, and so I still, good. yeah, of course, mm -hmm. and still I don't know like the results of the experiment, but but it will come, you know, mm -hmm. and like they had to be on, uh, be on the specific uh, uh, the foods and so. So uh, we, we shall see. I'm sorry, I just have to joke. It takes six men to do what four women can. Yeah. that's basically <laughs> no, the scientific no, experiment. No, I, I, I will give you. you like that, I, I will put you. Probably, sorry, I didn't, I will, didn't want to break your story. I will story. put you. I will put you even uh, like in a in a better perspective. Yes, because in the group where we uh, were doing the journey, it was just two women mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know eight men. Yes, so. Uh, or nine uh, nine men yes so because it was one was guide and so so uh, so yeah so of course i after seeing what you do 
Uh, I'm bowing to it. <laughs> uh, I will give a microphone to you. Uh, first of all, congrats that you survived and didn't turn to your back, uh, um, like and went went back right and, and succeeded. And thanks for sharing such a uh, inspirational uh, stories with, with us. Uh, really great uh, things to hear. Uh, this is something to be really amazed, I would say. Uh, but my question is. Um, how your life changed afterwards, like uh, how your values changed. Maybe in a family you applied that military regime and all your kids like going like in the same line and like doing the things yeah, yeah. <laughs> based on the clock uh, in a personal life, right? And uh, from a business perspective, right? From your, from your companies uh, where you're working and, uh, and so on, right? So that's the Thank question. Thank you very much for the question. Olga, maybe you can start. Mm -hmm. I have I have this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's such a deep question, and it's uh, seven minutes to five. So uh, how do I how do I do that? Um, there are a number of things that I feel differently after the mountains. Not particularly Everest. One of it it comes from particular Everest. Uh, some other things are 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 kind of uh, I got them on the other expeditions. And uh, one of them that's not from Everest particularly is that there is a rule in my mind that I try to remember to myself every time when I feel um, scared. And that the rule says, don't take yourself so seriously. Okay? Because this world is not revolving around my failures and around my success. Nobody gives a damn about my failures and my success, not even my kids or my family. This is basically, it just lives inside my mind. It is my ego is talking to whatever other side of my ego. So it's basically like a, a self-service in, in a way. And uh, every time when I get scared about something, whether you fail on a project and uh, uh, you've made a mistake in the contract and then maybe it will come at a cost to your company. And I mean, I don't know, every every day, or not, okay, not every day, but often there is something that you think I have either made a mistake or I, I, I can make a mistake or I can be judged by people around for doing something like not good enough and properly or mistakenly. And every time when this idea kind of comes into my mind, I just think, I really shouldn't be taking myself and the results of my life so very seriously. I, and that kind of get that, uh, that degree of suspense down. It's like, okay, I fail, so what? Like the universe stops spinning, like what will happen? Nobody will even notice, like nobody cares. So why, why, why do we care about ourselves so very much? And I think that is the mountaineer's perspective that uh, gave me that uh, attitude. <laughs> Um, no, I, um, I, I, I changed, uh, dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to be honest, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, to be honest, um, again, it's my philosophy. You do something and then you need to wait because you, you change one degree. Yes. It's like, you know, you're turning the ship and it will just give the effect uh, later. So, um, it's like the same asking you, you finished the EMBA program, did it change your life? You became, <laughs> you immediately became, uh, I don't know, better, more knowledgeable and so. No, of course you become, you know, more experienced, you, become, you, you have your new uh, network, you have uh, more confidence and so. So, and that's going to bring the change, but uh, please measure it after five years. So, so the same is here. I mean, my, my trips are, are so recent, but uh, I must say that, um, the whole this mountaineering and also uh, South Pole experience, it is, it is a bit of stepping out of uh, comfort zone, uh, like very practically, yes, like, you know, hygiene things and things like this, where you are exposing, where you are very vulnerable in front of others and you're doing things. And then, I mean, I had some st stage fevers and honestly, it, it's gone, you know, after those mountaineering uh, experiences. So. So, but uh, I just want to say that let's wait a few, five years after, you know, ask me about how this changed. 
I, I really hope that uh, Olga, you and Arnes, you are able to stay for some extra five, uh, ten minutes. I will close the event now, but I assume that some of you want to ask uh, any particular question to those uh, uh, two brave, uh, brave people. And uh, I noted myself that uh, I think that uh, Arne, that was you who said this phrase, uh, explorers usually go extra mile. I somehow liked mm -hmm. this comment. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, to reach something, there, there is always an extra mile to, to take because uh, otherwise uh, uh, you are, yeah. So thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, stories, for your experience. Uh, uh, now you know two great speakers whenever you need the inspiration for your teams or, or any other yeah, events. They are, no, I think, You've been very I, I generous. Think, I think that they, been very that they are. For those who haven't been uh, in, in two, two those places which you have... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, reached and it, it is inspiring. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. I think that our speakers deserve a round of applauses. Thank you.